and welcome to Her Wild Side Hockey Podcast. I am Mickey, aka Hockey She Wrote, and uh, welcome. This is the day before Thanksgiving. I've been meaning to make this episode for a couple of days now, but of course, with the holiday coming, both of my kids are sick, so it it is what it is. Um, but anyway, Thanksgiving. Um, it's, let's see. The one thing I wanted to say that I make sure, and I told my husband to go to the grocery store and get it because we are going to have Thanksgiving here now, is canned cranberry sauce. I would love to know if people out there love cranberry sauce and why the smooth one is the best. It has to be canned shaped. You know, you plop it, you just plop it right into a dish and that is the best dish of Thanksgiving. And no one can convince me otherwise. Um, oh, one other thing. If you are watching, I am wearing a, a green shirt and I have a green screen. You're just going to have to uh, ignore it, <laughs> my fuzzy shoulders, because I was too lazy to go upstairs and change my shirt. So here we are. All right. So this episode might be a little longer than usual because we're going to cover the whole Sweden trip. And... You know, I think the Sweden trip went really well. I know people are disappointed that they didn't win. They came away with two points, which seeing the whole run up to Sweden, that's that's pretty good considering how things were going. Anyway, we'll get to that. So first, let's talk about the Swedes. So we've got Philip Gustafsson, Jules Eriksson Ek, Jonas Brodin, and Marcus Johansson. And then they also brought along Jesper Volstead. And they were living it up over there. They landed and uh, pretty much immediately went to a red carpet event for a film, which I thought was kind of funny because they just don't seem like red carpet kind of people. But my favorite part was there's a, a picture that I was trying to find where it was posted. I think it's on Twitter, but where someone is interviewing Marcus Johansson and they're recording it on the phone. And the phone is so close to Marcus's face. It has to be so uncomfortable. But he looks like he is just trying to ignore it, which good for him. The other thing I think is pretty funny is they had like a uh, like a dinner for all of the Swedes. And then also invited Matt Zuccarello, which, you know, they say he's an honorary Swede. And like, apparently he's considered an honorary Swede everywhere because... He was he was there right next to all the other wild Swedes. Now the goalies, we're gonna we're gonna transition to the goalies because you know we got Gustafsson, and I love seeing Gus interact with Mark Andre Fleury. I think they have this relationship that is so almost like father son, father son goalies. And they just support each other so much. You could see during the games, you know, they skate over to the bench and the whoever is on the bench is, you know, yeah, you're doing a good job. Keep it up. Let's do it. And I just think that's so great. But my favorite thing is they had a, a video of Gus and Flurry talking to this whole crowd of kids. And Gus just absolutely burns Flurry. He's like, uh, so when did you start in the NHL? And Flurry's like, you know, 2003. And then he was like, um, any of you kids born then? And none of them. None of them were. And <laughs> Flurry, of course, just had a good laugh. But I just, I like that they have that, that kind of joking relationship along with kind of being emotional support. One of the best things that came out of this trip is the Not Weird Wild with the Swedes. The Swedes, I always want that to get more content from the Swedes because I I think they're really funny, but they just never, you know, seem to do it. But this was exactly what I needed. Uh, the bathrobes are hilarious. I love they're sitting there reading their books. Um, for some reason, Brodin has checked out a book on Sweden from the library and it is just boning up on his homeland, I guess. And then we have Ek reading and he does this little Hmm. Like he's very interested, except he's reading an Ikea manual for putting together the table that Johansson is trying to put together. They've got um, 
this exclusive club vibe that I think is so funny. Martini glasses full of Swedish fish. They have, uh, you know, like I said, Johansson's building this Ikea table. They only have ABBA records or ABBA. Like they have four and that's all they listen to apparently. And then I do love that there's a Gorg, Kevin Gorg cameo at the beginning. Uh, you know, everyone loves Gorgi. So having a little cameo from him in a not weird wild, two thumbs up. There was this other, I'm flipping back and forth here. Now, speaking of goalies, when they went to go take their team picture in Sweden on the ice, they had, you know, like a cart thing, a goalie mover. <laughs> and you had um, Flurry and Gus sitting on the back. And then Bogosian is kind of behind them, like peeking out. And then uh, they have stuffed Volstead in the front even though I think he's probably bigger than both of the other goalies, but just because he's young, they made him ride in the front. And they're sitting here, and as as they're getting ready to go, Maroon is coming out, and he was like, oh, hey, hold on, I'm going to get on, you know, hit, hit. and whoever's driving just does not hear. And uh, nobody tries to stop the cart driver either. They just sit there, and I saw someone on, on uh, social media say that they're kind of like naughty cats. Like, Flurry and Gus are just like, Teehing, they think it's so funny. And Bogosian is between them, just giggling out from between their shoulders. And then uh, the best of all is that as they drive away, right before the video cuts, Flurry says, there's a weight limit. And I'm sorry, I do feel bad for Maroon because I know that that's like a running thing. Like people like Fat Pat was his nickname, which is funny because he's not. <laughs> he's just a big guy. But uh, so then they had all these practices over there. I think they had two different practices. And Dewar actually looks happy in the pictures. Connor Dewar has this big smile on his face. And then we had the jump scare of Matt Zuccarello without teeth. And I didn't know that he was missing all of his front teeth. Now, I, I mean, it, it's a safe assumption to think that basically any hockey player has fake teeth, right? It's It's a very safe assumption. But I, the only one that you ever really see without the teeth is Middleton. So Zuki, like, I don't know like, what happened. He just didn't want to put his teeth in that morning. Like, I don't understand why he went to practice without teeth. I don't know. We'll see. And then the wild social media. First of all, whoever was running social media in Sweden did an excellent job. They made so many, like had so many cool pictures, uh, some cool content. And they did um, a video where, you know, they they like put their fist out to pound it and then they open it up and they have candy. So they have Swedish candy. Um, and I, I was trying to think of what it was called, but I, I'm not even going to try because I will just butcher it. First of all, it's very concerning how many of the guys look at the candy in the admin's hand. Like, it is very definitely a piece of candy. It has the same kind of um, wrapping as maybe like a Tootsie Roll, you know, where it's kind of like twisted on the ends. And I would say probably 75 plus percent of them take a look at it and go, what's that? Like, guys, it's it's candy. Uh, can you not tell that it's candy? It seems super obvious to me. But whatever, you know. But then we have Gustafson at the beginning. He eats the candy and then tries to give the wrapper back to the admin, which <laughs> just, I don't know, seems to fit his personality somehow. Then uh, Nick Patan is like super excited, like, oh, it's candy. Oh. And then we've got Brock Faber, who even before he gets the candy, as he's just walking up, he has just this big, huge grin on his face. He is just happy to be here. And he just is so happy. And the candy just made it even better. Like, how sweet is he? But I think my favorite was Connor Dewar. Because he literally takes a piece of candy and then walks away, just like inspecting it in his hand. Silently. Completely silently. Does not say a word. And it... <laughs> We get another Gorg cameo in this one, by the way. And then Jules Erickson Eck. First of all, this entire trip, he just was having a ball. Like, he was so excited. He was so happy. He was excited to get the candy. You know, how many times do you see Ecker in this video, like, actually, like, hamming it up? I mean, I guess last year, the waffle, the waffle video. He was also, apparently, he just is very happy when he gets food. 
So, uh, I mean, I understand. And then, uh, you know, we've got Kirill doing his oi, 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 which makes me laugh. And then Bill Guerin at the end, I'll eat anything. You know what, Bill? That's a good attitude to have when you're in a new country. And I appreciate that you wanted to try it. Now, logistically, this trip was the worst for the wild. The wild had the least amount of time to prepare. They had back-to-back, -back, not just back-to-back -back games, but from the end of the Saturday game to the beginning of the Sunday game was like 18 hours. They had an 18-hour turnaround. That's unheard of. I mean, it was, and I don't understand why they couldn't just push it up a few hours to give them 24 hours between. Now, I did post about this on Twitter and made a sarcastic joke about how, um, you know, oh, they're growing the, the sport of hockey by, you know, inconveniencing the state of hockey, I think is what I said. That's how they're growing the game. And first of all, people thought I didn't understand time zones, which I absolutely understand time zones, you guys. Like, I, I went to college. I graduated from college. I'm I know, I understand. But what I meant was, you know, to give them more time between. And also, we wouldn't have to get up super early. I mean, if they did it at 10 o'clock again, just like they did the Saturday game, I don't know what the harm, like, what's the harm in that? I have no idea. But the other bad part about, like, the logistics of this trip were that we are so far from games. You know, so they played... Last week, I think they played on a mon either Sunday or Monday. And then we had, you know, like five days. And then they played Saturday, Sunday. And now we have like five more days until they play on Friday. And I get it. You know, you want them to be able to recover from jet lag and all that stuff. But it just it's just a lot of time without hockey. But we're going to jump into the games because, like I said, I think that they, I would call the Sweden trip a success. And I know that people will scoff at that, <laughs> but that's okay. You can scoff all you want because I, I do think it was a success. At the beginning, they had Eck do the line read in the locker room. And I always have a good laugh when they have to read the line read and they're in it because Erickson, Erickson Eck is like me. <laughs> and, you know, I don't know. It makes me laugh. Then they had uh, Kirill Kaprizov had this quote from uh like the, the pregame who said we're here to have fun and which is exactly the kind of mindset that they needed to be in because they weren't there to have fun they were there to not only just play the games but try and turn their game around and get back to where they were or where they I guess where they were the first game and where they were last year because we haven't really seen it since then uh, Ryan Hartman was out sick. And so Nick Patan actually got to make his season debut with the Minnesota Wild in Sweden, which is kind of cool. Uh, they put Gustafson in net. And here's the thing. The, the biggest takeaway from this Senators game is that the, they fixed the PK. The penalty kill, I think it was like four for four. I know they struggled the next day, but it you know, it, it no longer means that they are going to give away a goal when they take a penalty. But they they did get a few penalties. Um, my favorite was that Middleton got into a fight. And, uh, you know, he's just a beauty for that. But my favorite is always you look at everyone else around. I mean, and usually it's the goalies, you know, like there's a scrum, everyone's fighting. And then the goalies are just like standing off to the side. And it's like that emoji with the guy just standing. But this time it was Pat Maroon just in the background, just standing like kind of blank expression. Didn't seem to take care one way or the other. was just watching the show. The Wild actually score first in this game, which is something that has not been happening. And uh, it was Rossi. He got a, a pass from Faber and Zuccarello. They assisted. And that made him he was tied for second in rookies in goals for rookies and tied for fifth for points for rookies after that. Rossi's family was there and got to watch him. Uh, his friends, he had a couple friends who like made this giant sign for him. It was just, it's been really cool to see 
how far he's come and how he's still, he's even still developing. He's getting better and better as we go. There was also this moment where somehow they're in front of Gus and Spurgeon, I think he maybe had laid out. Spurgeon's on like his hands and knees trying to get up and somehow Brady Kachuk like falls on him and then the puck goes by him. So instead of getting up, Brady like spins like a break dance move on Spurgeon's back. And I don't, <laughs> it, I mean, I understand, but it was kind of like, like, get up, like get off of him. <laughs> um, and you know, we all know that we lost, we lost in a shootout though. We got all the way, we held our game. We really stuck with it. There was no point where they kind of dropped off and we still got a point. It was two, one game. We've been getting all these games with like eight goals, seven goals, six goals, you know, 10 between the two. And we need to be getting more used to low scoring, keeping it out of our net. And they were able to do that. Some of the most important news from that uh, game was also that Nordy won the dance off against Spartacat. I think that's probably because he had uh, quite a few more fans than Sparta Cat, just because of Minnesota and how they travel. But you know what? It was the news I was waiting for. There, let's see. I have all these notes to get you guys. I have like four pages of notes today because it's just, I have so much to say. But there was this interesting kind of uh, chart that showed that the line of Felino, Maroon, and Letary were most often paired with the defensive pairing of Bogosian and Merrill, which makes so much sense when you're thinking about it because, you know, Felino, Maroon, they are your most kind of defensive line. Besides, I mean, if they had Ek, they really, you know, but um, they were the most defensive with the the weak, I don't like saying weakest, but the weakest pairing of defensemen. And maybe that was part of their success. They were able to kind of just keep rolling the same things, the same line with the same, you know, defensemen. And that was maybe working. I don't know. We will see. Uh, once again, Matt Boldy and Kirill Kaprizov were invisible. They just, you just, they're not the superstars that they need to be. I will say, that Kaprizov did look better. He looks like he's getting back to how he normally skates. I don't know if it's still that lingering injury from last year and he just doesn't want to take time off. I don't know if he is just really affected by like he got the A and now he feels a lot of pressure. But whatever it is, I think he's starting to come out of that. The power play, the, the power play needs major work. We saw that in both games and it's not a surprise. Gus was rock solid in that. The Gus that played in Sweden was the Gus from last year and the Gus from the, the season opening game against the Panthers. And I'm hoping that that is what we keep saying. I think the, the Sweden trip, you know, really could be a game changer for the wild and even just for uh, individual players, maybe. And hopefully Gustafsson is one of those. So far, they still have the rookies running the show. Faber and Rossi are kind of the, the glue holding this team together. And it's, I love it. And also I hate it. Be, you know, I, you know. After the game, they also, you know, they're coming in, interviewing. And Brodeen is wearing Cotter Dewar's, like, jacket <laughs> with Dewar's 26 on it. And... They, it kind of feeds into this trend from last year where they were constantly wearing other people's clothes. They were constantly just like grabbing whatever was the nearest shirt. They did not care if it was theirs. They did not care what number or name was on it. They were just going to wear that to the interview. And I just, you know, I like that. And then the Leafs game. So once again, 18 hours later, we wake up. It's early for us here in Minnesota. Uh, because of time zones, it was not early in Sweden. But we had the news that, that Freddie Goudreau was off of long-term injured reserve and that Ryan Hartman was back. Although they did have Letary take warm-ups just in case, but Hartman was able to come back. And actually, you could see throughout the game that like he was getting 
better and better. You could see them kind of getting stronger and stronger out there. They did put Flurry in net, but they they made a point to say that after how well Gustafson played, they actually considered putting him back in the net. And I I was kind of hoping they would. I think part of the reason they didn't was because, you know, Flurry. He's getting close to retirement. He needs those wins. He uh, traveled to Sweden and he might as well have a turn in the net. And I get it. But just Gustafson played so well. Plus, after two back-to-back games, they have like five days off. I think they only had two technically off. You know, they had practice and all that. But So you could kind of really tire Gus out and he would have time to rest. But they put Flurry, they put Flurry in the net. Um, so let's see. The pregame started at 6.30. I love Audra Martin and Mark Parrish. They did this little open where they're in like their pajamas and they have their coffee mugs and slippers. And um, then, you know, they kind of like snap their fingers and they're dressed. And I just thought it was so cute. Like what a cute way to start the show. And I just, I love those two. I love Audra and Mark when they're on the desk. We had uh, en- en- entrance pictures. We have Vanilla Terry in a three-piece plaid suit. And he is single-handedly upping the fashion game of the wild. At least with that suit he is. I love something a little different. It was my favorite. Uh, hands-down favorite. So they put Goudreau back on the second line. Bumped Eck down to third. Kind of, you know, that's kind of what we expected. We get to the game. And first of all, they sing both the Canadian and the American anthem before the game, which makes sense because obviously it's a Canadian team and American team. Uh, kind of weird they did not do the Swedish anthem because they're in Sweden. But I don't know if maybe they just didn't want to stand around that long or what. But the wild, there's like a shot of the wild bench as they're singing. And they could not stand still. There was not one single player on that bench standing still. They were literally just swaying back and forth. And like, just like jittering, like they just wanted to get going. They also showed a couple shots of like player families in the stands, which I thought was really fun. They, you know, they kept showing Erickson X grandma, especially, and it was really cute to see her like reactions to the game. And they also actually put in a shot of Stesha, who is Kirill's girlfriend. And Stesha is from Russia. That's where Karel met her, I'm assuming. And, uh, but she traveled to Sweden for the games. And I don't remember what happened. Something Kaprizov ran into someone or maybe it was Czech. And Stesha, like they showed this little clip of her just like, oh, you know, she's getting all like worried about Karel. And it was just very cute. There was a big scrum at the end of the period. And there's a picture that I love. Okay, first of all, so Brodine, who does not really normally get into a scrum, somehow gets himself involved. And then Faber comes like racing in to save him because there are two guys kind of like on Brodine. He comes racing in to save him. And then they have this shot of whoever, do, someone had Connor Dewar in like a headlock. And he is just like fighting for his life in there. You know, he comes out of it and he's just like, so disoriented and like trying to fix his helmet and he was just like fighting for his life and then there was pat maroon who was having the time of his life he's standing there there's a picture of him just like smiling you know there's like a ref trying to separate him from whoever was trying to shove him and push him and maroon just has like the biggest smile on his face and i love that i love that this was really a game where we saw zuccarello very uh, apparent, very like out there making stuff happen. He was like going berserk mode in front of the net is how I put it, because you've got, first of all, he scored the goal, um, in the first period. I had to, I had to look there. Um, first of all, his celebration video that they post on social media is so Zuki that I don't think I could create anything more Zuki. It's basically just him putting his arms up in the sky and then screaming. (laughs) Like everybody else has like, yeah, or like, woohoo, or, you know, something. He's just screaming at the sky. And then he's just like, meh, done. (laughs) So then uh, Rossi got an assist, which 
bumped him up to be tied for third for points from rookies. And it's so fun to see him on top. Both him and Faber are very much in contention for the Calder at the end of the season this year. They are both, again, keeping this team together. They are pulling stuff together on the ice. And I, th- both of them deserve it. Can they share it? Like, I don't know if they can share, you know, like where the week, like one person gets one week and then the next person gets the other week and they, you know, go back and forth with the Calder Cup or not the Calder Cup, the Calder Trophy. You know what I mean? Uh, there's also a shot of Zuccarello's brother hugging their mom in the crowd after Zuki scores. And Zuki's brother is wearing a Kirill Kaprizov jersey. <laughs> And I don't know if, like, he's fallen under the spell of Kaprizov, like, Zuccarello, like Matt's has. Or if he maybe just feels weird wearing a jersey with its own name on the back. I don't know. But it made me laugh. Zuki also had this moment, like I said, he was going berserk mode, where he, like, there's, like, this giant Leafs player. I don't even know who it was. He, like, full-on punches the Leafs player in the face. This guy's, like, a foot taller than Zuki. And then somehow, like, ends up wrestling him to the ground. And I, someone posted the little clip of that and made this kind of, uh, uh, what do I want to say? Um, made this kind of, this statement, that's not the word I was looking for, but that he has the temperament of a chihuahua in a dog shelter. And if that is not the absolute truth, I don't know what is. Because he does. He is very much a chihuahua in a dog shelter. We had... Three goals, John Merrill, Jake Middleton, and Matt Zuccarello. Again, the first two, unlikely goal scorers. I always love that. It's nice to see everybody kind of pitching in. On the other hand, that's not great because that means that our top scorers are not scoring. They're not doing what they're supposed to do. And somehow the bottom, you know, the bottom six and the defense are the ones that are ending up chipping in and scoring all these goals. Now, this is a, a come from behind win, which was really fun. It kind of remind reminded me of uh, two years ago when every time, like third period was like magical. There was just, it didn't matter how far behind the wild were, they were just always going to come back. And, you know, even if they end up losing in overtime, they were able to make up this, this point deficit to get there. So, you know, we went to overtime and came away with the point. So we ended the road trip with two points. I was hoping for three. I mean, I I guess we were all really hoping for four, but I would have taken three. Two is, I don't, you know, I'm not mad about it. I'm just not. Now, funny enough, looking at the stats, uh, Merrill and Bogosian were a really solid defensive pair in this game. I don't know what happened or why. They just really, like, kicked it up a notch. And the funny part is that the Wild, who were coming off of, again, like in less than 24-hour back-to-back, they were the ones that seemed to have more energy. I don't know if they just kind of had in their mind that they were just like, you know, for those two days, it was like hockey. And that had they're just going to focus and they're going to get through the tiredness and through, you know, the, the weak legs, whatever. But they absolutely outskated the Leafs. I mean, it was just kind of a fun, a funny happenstance. Power play still sucks. Uh, No surprise there. I I mean, I'm hoping that at some point they figure that out. You know, it, and the PK is better. So that's uh, a win. Let's just take a win from that. The other thing I wondered is, should they have played Gustafson? I mean, Fleury wasn't playing his best. He was still good. He was not playing his best. And I wonder how Gustafson would have handled the game. But, you know, we never know. So since then, Nick Patan and Damon Hunt are back with the Iowa Wild, along with Jesper Volstead. And Dakota Mermis was placed on waivers to make room for cap space so that Goudreau could come back on Sunday. And he did clear waivers. and But he's still with the Minnesota Wild. I think he's going to stay with them until... Goudreau is back. Or, sorry. (laughs) Galvagoski. We'll get there, folks. So, I'm assuming that's because they have not assigned him back to Iowa. Everyone was, like, really mad about 
them putting Mermis on waivers, but I think they did that on purpose when they were in Sweden, because here's the thing, what team is going to pick him up while he's in Sweden? Like, yes, he's been playing really well. He's done a really good job, but they're not going to like fly him back just so that they can have him on a team. I don't know. But like I said, I'm assuming that he is there until Goligoski is back. We will see. So, like I said, Galagasi is still on long-term injured reserve, but he's basically ready to go. I I think it... I'm trying to remember how many games he's been out, and I'm not... I don't remember. But, you know, he's got to be coming up to 10. So I wonder if once they get to that, if they're just going to, you know, toss him back in. We'll see. So then we have... There's the a meme about... Dairy Queen going around. I'm trying to think of how to explain this for people who have not seen it. But what it is, it's a little four graph. And on the top, it says, uh, couldn't run a Dairy Queen, could run a Dairy Queen, doesn't want to run a Dairy Queen, wants to run a Dairy Queen. And someone shared two of them with wild players, and they were so spot on, just absolutely spot on. So first of all, we have kind of the younger one, which... Matt Boldy, he would just fully not be on board. He d- he would not want to run a Dairy Queen, and he would not be good at it. He just, nope, he's done. And then we have Brandon Duhame, who we all know he would love to run a Dairy Queen. It's, like, just obvious. It kind of, like, oozes out of him. He would love to run a Dairy Queen. But he has no focus. He would probably burn the food, and they would also run out of supplies because he would forget to just order anything. So it would not be a successful Dairy Queen. Connor Dewar, on the other hand, has great organization and would run a really good Dairy Queen, but he kind of hates people, so he does not want to run a Dairy Queen. Although I wonder if the two Deweys together could run Dewey Dairy Queen, and then together they would be able to make it work. But then you have Mason Shaw, and he would not only be good at running the Dairy Queen, he would love it. He's a people person. He would love it. And then we had another another version of that with kind of the older guys. So we've got Ryan Hartman. He would not be good at it. I think, you know, his temper. He would just not be okay with customer service. And I think that he just doesn't want to. You know, he's got other things to do. He doesn't want to run a Dairy Queen. And then there's Marcus Foligno. And he's got that golden retriever energy. And that energy would mean that I, we, you just know he would love to run it. Just like Duhame, he would love to run a Dairy Queen. And you also know that he would be terrible at it. He has what I'm assuming is a short attention span. So I just, you know, again, a failure. And then there's Jonas Brodeen, who would be great at running a Dairy Queen, and he would hate it. And then Spurgeon, who would love running it and will be good at it. Now you tell me if there is any uh, lie in that, in the space of that, because... I just spot on, like just absolutely spot on. Now, all the rest of the wild players, I don't know. Uh, You know, I feel like some of them you can't really pin. Anyway, if you have any ideas, let me know. So then today there was an open practice, which I did not attend because like I said, I have sick children. But Hartman kind of made this this quip afterwards about he doesn't know when Minnesota kids go to school because they're always at open practices. And I, that's one thing I love is that you go to an open practice. Sometimes there's like 200 people there, I think. Oh, And I think that's just like awesome. I don't know another team that that happens. But then Brodeen said they're excited for Friday. Uh, he talked about using the trip to come together as a team. And I am also really excited for Friday to see them and see how different they look, uh, see if they look like the team that was in Sweden. We will see. And then in the video, though, Brodin's poor nose. So he got hit in the face with a puck on Saturday. I had to think because he took the, the puck drop on Sunday in his poor nose. But they had like had to glue his nose back together. And he just, uh, you know, has his poor nose. So then Marcus Foligno, he posted an Instagram post from Sweden. And it was the absolute most Felino wine mom, mama moose kind of a slideshow 
of pictures. So first of all, we had a couple landscape pictures because you always have to get a landscape picture. There were some food pictures because, again, that's just what you got to do. He took a picture of the moose statues, which I thought was pretty funny. I'm sh I just have this image of him coming, like stumbling across these moose light up statues and just like, like giggling. I'm like, whoa. And then the last picture is uh, someone said mom and dad. <laughs> it's Spurgeon and Felino together. And Felino is wearing an eye mask, but they're like smiling for the picture. And I think the best part of it is that he has over the entire entire slideshow of pictures, put an ABBA song. I mean, Marcus Foligno, everybody. He is, he is just a beauty. He's a gem. So I'm going to plug two things here that I will link down in the show notes. Number one, I was invited last week to do a little spot on Split the Defense Hockey Podcast. It was really fun to talk to them about kind of what I was thinking before the Leafs wild game on Sunday that came out last week. If you'd like to watch it, like to uh, listen to it, please do. It was really fun to be on there and I'm excited to, you know, hopefully come on again. I also wrote an article for last weekend, kind of ranking the Minnesota wild nicknames because one of the stat websites added nicknames and some of them were so out of pocket. Like just nicknames that are so ridiculous that I've never heard before, but they were also missing some super obvious ones. So I ranked them because that is my contribution to hockey journalism. I do love just the fact that I, that's what I write now for hockey wilderness is the, the vibes. And you know, I'm all about the vibes. There's a couple other things like outside of the world of Minnesota Wild that I wanted to talk about. First of all, the Winter Classic jerseys were finally actually released after being spoiled by the Utah Jazz. <laughs> I, not only the Utah Jazz, but then there was another one that I saw like wrestlers or like boxers or something and they were wearing them, except the NHL had not announced it yet. So I don't know what happened and like what wires got crossed there, but I think it's hilarious that the Utah Jazz spoiled the Winter Classic jerseys. Now, the Vegas jerseys, eh, eh, eh. Seattle, 10 out of 10. Like, no notes. Would absolutely love that jersey. Of course, I, I, you know, my brother will buy one, so I'll just wear his if he, if he hasn't. But I have to say, my favorite winter classic jersey is always going to be Minnesota from 2021. Just classic. Minneapolis, St. Paul, so good. There was also a story coming around hockey Twitter about in a team in the ECHL, Kalamazoo, who somehow drove all the way to the game, an away game, obviously, and forgot to bring jerseys, like literally forgot jerseys. <laughs> so instead, they were playing Toledo. So they wore uh, Toledo's practice jerseys for the first period until someone could drive the jerseys there. And I just... I love it. Like, that's probably the biggest mistake you could make as an equipment manager. Or You know what? The biggest you could make is if you forgot sticks. I mean, jerseys, that's, jerseys are replaceable. You know, like, you, they, they wore practice jerseys. It was fine. Sticks would be another, another thing. And since I'm talking all about jerseys, apparently, in this little sidebar, the Iowa Wild did their Star Wars night, and they had Wookiee jerseys that went like viral and they are they are super cool and they even have like some star wars writing thing um it was such a cute little picture and they have uh t-shirts and stuff i don't know it was really awesome whoever designed that was amazing and then they also the the vancouver canucks came out with these new helmets that are matte black not shiny and I love that so much. And I really hope other hockey teams try it out because it just looks so sleek. And I also heard that now they have ruled that you can wear like the opposite helmet. So if they're in like the white jersey, they can wear a green helmet. 
or the green jersey white helmet. I kind of like that. I hope that the Wild do that. I'd love to see it. So the Wild play again on Friday at 7.30. Uh, I am hoping to be there. I do not know who I will be with. Some family member or someone I drag along. But I will be there. And I'm so excited because it feels like it's been forever since I have been there. Um, if anyone else is going to be there, let me know. I, I sit on club level. If you sit up there too, I'd love to say hi. And other than that, you know what? I actually, my four pages of notes, I kind of, I went through that good. I This is about the same amount of time as it usually is. That's good. I'm, you know, apparently you're supposed to aim for consistency in your podcast. And so far, I have not. So I am sorry about inconsistency. But until my next podcast, uh, I am here. I am on social media, Hockey She Wrote, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Is, Twitter is where you'll find me most. Uh, otherwise, until then, just keep the vibes in mind. You know, keep the vibes in mind. Everything will be great. The wild vibes are feeling great. And we'll see. All right. See you later.